Welcome everyone. We'll get started in a few minutes, okay? How's everyone doing? Good. Can everyone hear me on Zoom? Yeah? Cool. We're not doing some right. <laughs> We're going to give a few minutes before we start. I'm going to do one. They're still eating pizza over there? They're coming in? Okay. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started for today's uh, forum. Uh, this is our opiate overdose prevention and harm reduction forum that we're gonna be having today. So thank you all for coming today and uh, taking the time to come out here. Uh, thank you for the UU Church for providing us the space so that we can host this forum as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Fidel Chagoya. I'm a grad student at the University of Redlands and the program I'm in is clinical mental health counseling. I'll just be finishing up my practicum hours. Um, and I would just like to uh, let the audience know, please hold your questions until the end. Um, we're gonna have a, a little historical context with followed by that is gonna be some storytelling and then presentation um, as well as a, a panelist uh, that have directly been affected by uh, fentanyl. And then with that, um, we're gonna lead into uh, Riverside Overdose Data Action as well as IE harm reduction. Um, 
please, for those on Zoom, please stay on mute if you are not talking so that we can hear our presenters. Advice for folks is to use the chat function to share questions and additional information. And in case you like, as we're presenting, as we're having conversation, uh, if you have any questions, kind of like jot those things down so then that way you can refer back to your questions. So then that way when we do have a uh, um, open time for uh, questions and answers, uh, we can answer your questions as well. So we'll start off with uh, um, one of our presenters, which is gonna be uh, Emma. She'll be going over the historical context of what we're our uh, forum today. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, thank you for being here today. I'll open us up with um, some context to what's led us here with mass incarceration and the war on drugs. Um, so the US has historically used anti-drug legislation to oppress black, brown and immigrant communities with the first anti-drug law targeting Chinese immigrants who were using opium in the 1800s. These Chinese immigrants were brought to the US to replace the labor of formerly enslaved black people after the end of the Civil War. And the American fear mongering towards opium caused major fear towards Chinese immigrant communities and was a major factor in the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned Chinese immigration altogether for 10 years. And a century later, we saw the CIA's destabilization of Latin America during the Cold War, directly facilitating the sale of crack cocaine to South Central LA and other black communities. This marked the beginning of a new era of mass incarceration and policing. In response to the spread of crack cocaine in the US, Congress began enacting harsher drug policies and expanding policing and criminalization known as the war on drugs. These harsh sentencing laws launched the era of mass incarceration during which the US prison population grew by 800%, devastating black communities and other communities of color. This approach of extreme punishment along with the creation of the massive scale just say no and dare anti-drug campaign messaging intensely stigmatized drug users, making Americans view them with fear and suspicion, seeing drug users as having failed on an individual level rather than that at the hands of a system. This racist, tough on crime method destabilized entire communities for generations and disproportionately targeted black Americans and communities of color. Policing and inc incarceration of black people as a form of social control had replaced the overt discrimination and violence that had been made illegal during the civil rights era. Nixon's domestic policy advisor was even quoted saying, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or blacks, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. A new social order was being formed. The association of black people with drugs and crime and of policing with virtue and as necessary to keep peace, order and safety. None of this was preventing overdose deaths or keeping communities safe. In fact, during the same time period, social services and safety nets were being stripped away. At the same time, incarceration was on the rise and support services were being defunded. The number of children in the foster care system skyrocketed, disproportionately impacting black children and children of color. The drug war provided a new ever increasing supply of prisoners over the past 15 years due to mandatory minimum sentences and three strikes laws. With 5% of the world's population, the United States now holds 25% of the world's prisoners. The number of black men in prison, which is 70, 792,000, has already equaled the number of men enslaved in 1820. Today, people of color are 2.5 times more likely to be arrested for drug possession than whites, even though they use the same amount of drugs. We incarcerate more people than any other country in the world, largely because of these drug laws. Because of the stigma created by incarceration and just say no messaging, many people, see, still, many people still see drug use as individual failure and treat drug users with fear and hostility. Prisons and policing receive funding as the so-called solution to social issues, homelessness and mental illness and poverty. But we know that incarceration simply replicates these social issues and creates further race and class disparities. As potent opioids and fentanyl have become more common due to overprescription of pain medication, we must take new approaches to keeping our communities healthy and safe from overdose. Overdoses on synthetic opioids like fentanyl are nearly 23 times higher than 10 years ago, 
and over half of all overdose deaths today are from fentanyl. As we know, criminalization and abstinence-only approaches did not reduce drug use or overdose. They instead caused social isolation, generational trauma, and disenfranchisement among communities of color. People often enter the cycle of incarceration, homelessness, and poverty because of a drug arrest, or this cycle causes them to turn to drugs out of hopelessness or desperation. From opium to crack cocaine to fentanyl, we recognize that drug use has been weaponized by state apparatuses to prevent immigration, expand policing and surveillance, and to disenfranchise and weaken the possibility of solidarity and political organizing among communities of color. These things have all happened in the name of our public health and safety, but it's clear that current drug policies do not reduce usage, overdose, or keep us safe. Today, harm reduction is widely re recognized as a life-saving approach, and drug decriminalization campaigns are gaining traction across the country. More people are beginning to understand that we must invest in the things that keep us safe and let us thrive, like healthcare, affordable housing, and other social programs. The US spends over 115 billion on police and prisons alone each year. When we spend so much time and money on prisons and policing, our capacity for care is greatly diminished in both our budgets and our imaginations. Harsher drug laws are not the answer to today's fentanyl crisis. Instead, we must make treatment and supportive services more widely available and educate people who use on how to do it safely. For better or for worse, drug use is a part of today's world and we can work to minimize its effects and its harms without condemning those who use. Our collective power comes from our refusal to let racist, class classist, anti-drug rhetoric divide us. We refuse to turn our backs on each other because we know it keeps us safe, supporting each other without judgment and fighting for a world where we have all the resources we need to thrive. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that, Emma. Now, I mean, what I heard there is historical context of how drug use continues to be criminalized. And the whole purpose is to step back a little bit, right? And to uh, examine some of the things that already have taken place that led to mass incarceration, criminalizing. But have we uh, move forward with finding any solutions? So that's the whole point of our forum today is just to provide that context, right? So then that way we're not forgetting what's already taken place, what's already have happened. And then we can bring it back to the time that we're in right now and seeing how can we move forward? How can we collaborate? How can we work with each other? And how can we get this information to our folks out there if they choose to continue to use? At least we want them to be safe so that way they can save each other's lives. And that's gonna lead in with uh, our next uh, presenter is going to be uh, Fanon. Fanon is going to be giving us uh, a little bit of storytelling. So good afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fanon Figures. I'm formerly a, a case manager. <clears throat> Excuse me case manager and a, a resource person for the Starting Over Inc. And for, 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 for starters, let me say this. I personally have no knowledge or personal knowledge of opioids, fentanyl, or anything. But because I deal with the population, that, that it, it had made me get educated, from me getting educated. So let me back up a little bit. I go into CRC, that's California Rehabilitation Center. And in there, they have people that have drug issues and then, you know, they're, they're, they're deemed as bad because they had a drug issue. So yesterday when I went in there, I got personal testimonies of personal men that's incarcerated, but also have drug issues. And he was telling me more than what the, what I found in data about the information about fentanyl and what it would, one guy told me, and I quote, his name is Matt. And he said, he hit, he hit rock hard when he was in prison. He came to jail with a, a heroin a heroin addiction. And then coming to prison, they he's now hooked on Suboxone. So they give you Suboxone to transfer you away from the heroin. But now he's addicted to that because now they're inside. They're smoking it. They're inhaling it. They're not using it for what its use is for. But guess what? He's still not getting he's still not getting the cure for his original pain and his original pain, whatever that may be. But he's using the crutch of the drug to to uh, exasperate whatever's going on in his life. And he doesn't realize it yet. And so that was one of the men that was uh, 
that I was talking to. And then we was talking about the opioid use, right? And like I said, I was very like, um, prior to, when did this, maybe two weeks ago, I was very naive to any of this stuff. But in my in my research and reading and talking to other people, I see it as an epidemic. And it came out like in 2011, 20, 2011, 2014, when it really hit out into the uh society. It was a, it was a it was a thing they were trying, they were using um, wow, what's the guy's name? He was a CEO and he made it, he made it like sort of like public. And that's when, you know, unfortunately, someone will say, Oh, this guy overdosed, so he has some good drugs and he died. That's like a uh like an enticement. So, Hey, I want that drug, you know, and it, it's just like an oxymoron, but that's what happens because they're not some good drugs. So what happened when they came out with the other stuff, the fentanyl, they don't, people not knowing that they're using this stuff to, to cook, uh, cut the dough with, they don't know this stuff. They're just using it. Um, don't know if you got pretty sure you guys heard the big thing about the, the little baby that died of fentanyl. She wasn't using nothing. She was in a percentage of, uh, proximity of it and she passed away you know what i mean so this is letting you know that the fentanyl is very very strong and it's not to be used but if i don't know or if someone just introduced some drugs to me and i'm a drug user i'm just using the drug so what we try to do now is like yes we want to tell uh, the men and women don't use drugs that's the number one thing but say one thing we want to say say if you're going to use drugs at least know what you're doing so you don't die or you don't kill yourself so that's what the things we're doing we're educating people that comes into our organization as well as that's in in uh, California Rehabilitation Center because they're coming out to society and they're coming out to society with um, now, <laughs> like I say, addicted to boxing. So my thing is, I think that uh, the educational part of knowing what is going on with the fentanyl and the opioid is very essential. And I think that as long as we're here, we spread the word to the people. So we all know that people are going to use drugs. But we want you to use safe so you don't kill yourself or you don't allow someone else to get killed by the drugs you're out there distributing because you don't even know what you're mixing with. And so what we do at Starting Over Eight is, is educate because education it brings about knowledge and knowledge brings about wisdom. And then we can overcome some of the barriers that we're having. And I'm glad you all are here. And I, I hope that we can share and come together and try to uh, stop this epidemic and really educate our peoples. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fanon, for providing that information about the work that you do, the most important work that you do uh, by going inside and, and in reaching those folks in there, those men and women, and providing this information for them. So then that way they know uh, if they choose to use, they know where to get these resources at, they know where they could go to treatment uh, facilities at, they know where they could go to detox centers, they know where to get fentanyl ships, they know where to get Narcan. Because the thing, the thing about it is, like you said, like I heard you say, educate, right? That's the whole thing. We need to educate not only the folks on our side, but out here in our community as well, because a lot of the times we lose focus with that, right? Uh, so I think those are important things that you mentioned right there when it comes down to like the, the work that you have been doing uh, with providing this information to those folks in there. So that way they're prepared because the thing about it is there's so many folks getting out now. There's 70 million people living with the record today, right? And they face 48,000 barriers. barriers with housing, whether it's employment, uh, whether it's licensure, uh, whether it's accessing education, uh, whatever it is, they face a whole lot of barriers after they've done their time. And on top of that, they need to be educated about what's happening out here right now. So then that way they are fully aware, you know, uh, because some of these folks are gonna go back to their same communities. They might have not have no social support no family support, and we want to provide this information for them so that way we prepare them for when they do get out. Um, so our next uh, panelist is going to be Michael Gerardo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Gerardo. I also uh, work with Starting Over, Inc. Uh, my capacity is participatory defense. Uh, what resonated with uh, Fanon's uh, speech was when he said that uh, a guy overdosed and uh, he had some good dope. And that's the reality of, of uh, this disease that we're faced with. A lot of times we, we face or how can I say this? We self-medicate. Like the reality is like whatever we're faced with, it's easier to self-medicate. And a lot of times it may have started with an illegal, I mean, a legal drug, 
I know when I was in prison, I went through a lot of back injuries and uh, they eventually put me on methadone. And I got addicted to methadone. And uh, the reality was this, they was giving it to me for the right purpose, but then I got addicted to it. And uh, I don't think that was the determining factor at that present time, but that was the, uh, the end result. So I do realize uh, I was also uh, addicted to criminology, crimi criminality, uh, which led me to prison and that's an addiction. So all these things coincide with what we're faced today is, is everything is connected. The addiction leads to criminality, criminality leads to imprisonment and it's feeding a broken cycle and nobody's ever getting fixed. They're not getting actually what they need. But that's just on my personal thing. Uh, but I, I'm supposed to do the presentation on the overview of opioid epidemic. And uh, it goes, ep opioid epidemic is a public health crisis in the U.S. with prescription drugs. Prescription drugs, abuse control the epidemic has affected millions of people and prompt the gov government strict measures to curb the problem this is going back to like uh we said we said uh emma said in her presentation was this is just another form of the crack epidemic getting tough on drugs and locking you up instead of actually uh dealing with the issue at hand and uh it goes into overdose rates have steadily increased over the years in the Inland Empire, Black and Latino residents are more likely to overrepresent in prisons and jails due to racial profiling and mass incarceration. Because of this, they are also higher risk of overdose. Like everybody that I work with, I have a, uh, a desire for the formerly incarcerated because I know the plights that they face when they get out of prison. And, uh, you know, I might want to get out and celebrate. I just did all this time you know, and that's the realities that we're faced with, but you can't come out here like you did when you went in. The drugs of today are not the same drugs as yesterday. Uh, I can't get a joint from my homeboy on the streets because it can be laced with fentanyl. And my system is so clean from doing all this time that that can be the overdose that I never believed that would happen from a joint, you know, but these are the realities that we face today. And it's just about bringing awareness to our communities uh, and the formerly incarcerated, that their lives do matter and they deserve far greater than that. It goes to criminalization and de uh, decriminalization experienced by people with use of drugs, especially harmful towards people of color who face heightened stigmas and harsher punishments. BIPOC community members who use, and especially those who are just as impacted, can feel socially isolated, creating negative and physical mental health consequences. Like, uh, I've been out four years and I still battle with uh, adapting into society. Like, uh, sometimes in my dysfunction, I feel more comfortable when I was in prison. I know how to navigate on the yard. Uh, I know how to get rid of a celly when I don't like them. Out here, it's a little more difficult. Somebody might cut you off on the freeway and you find yourself just tightening up, tensing and uh, out here in our society, we're very disrespectful towards one another. And uh, that drives that stress level. And then you, you need an outlet. Oh, let me go get me a beer tonight. I'm, I'm, I had a hard day at work. That beer leads to two beers. Next thing you know, the beer is not satisfying me. So I need to get something a little bit stronger. And that's how we lead into those addictions and not even realizing that now the substance has control over us. So uh, how opiates affect the body and the brain. Wow. So opiates are opiates act on the brain's receptors to block pain signals from the body leading to a feeling of euphoria and relaxation. However, they also act on areas of the brain responsible for regulating breathing leading to a risk of respiratory depression and fatalities. This section explores the effects of opiates on the body and brain in detail. Uh, opiates, uh, like I said, it just gives you a pain reduction, withdrawals, feelings of happiness, intoxicants, 
that are all just uh, like a Band-Aid on the real problem. So I don't need to go into that. Prevention strategies of addiction and overdose. Uh, as Benan said, I mean, Fidel said earlier, that we have tools at our disposal. Uh, the, the Narcan, you know, these things can help us. Don't get high by yourself. You know, if the realities are that we're losing people every day to this epidemic. And this is about awareness. I never want to get in a position where I'm telling a person, don't use drugs. We got enough programs doing that already. I want to say I love you enough that your life is worth more. And if you're going to choose to use drugs, do it in a responsible manner to safeguard your health and don't want to put your family through anything. Uh, harm reduction. Harm reduction refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize the negative health and social and legal impacts associated with drug use and drug policies. Uh, I always felt if you had you battle with any level of mental illness, that prison is not the place where you prison exacerbates it. Prison is not about uh, rehabilitation. It's a it's a hostile environment. So if I'm battling with a mental illness, why would you put me in this platform or this form of area? When I go and see my counselor for five minutes, then I go back to the yard and it's just hostility. So that just makes the problem even worse. And then we want to release them back to society and, and they're not getting the care that they need. Uh, some harm reduction practices include educating people on safer drug use and providing safe spaces for individuals to use, whether by providing clean syringes or monitoring the injection sites to prevent overdose. In today's world, drugs are widely available and people use for a variety of reasons, poverty, racism, social isolation, and past traumas. Like, that's the reality. All of us carry uh, some level of trauma from our childhood. And uh, we medicate, we self-medicate, you know, even if it's legal medication or illegal. And we, it allows us to cloud our vision and realities and face and whatever we carry every day. Uh, all right, where we at? Poverty, race, and social, social isolation. And past trauma can also play in people's roles. And vulnerability to drug-related harm by providing a safe space without judgment and using a harm reduction approach. We can greatly decrease, decrease opiate overdose and deaths. Uh, signs and symptoms of opiate use. Like these are the really um, things that we need to know. Because like in the field of uh, nonprofit and we're, we're working with our communities, uh, we're going to come across people that may be in, in a crisis and we need to know the warning signs and how to protect them and save their lives. So the physical signs are slow breathing, constricted pupils, confusion, constipation, and nausea. Uh, behavioral signs are social withdrawal, neglect, and responsibilities, change in friends, friend groups, and frequent unexplained absence or lateness. Like our, our <laughs> in my criminality, I could just remember uh, avoiding uh, some of the responsibilities. Like I, I lived in darkness. You know, I wanted my room dark. I didn't want to come out until it was dark. And that probably was the guilt that I, I was trying to hide all the bad things that I was doing in my life at that particular time. And as I stand today, first thing I do when I wake up is turn the light on, open the blinds. I want to let the light in to show that I'm no longer walking that same walk. I'm walking a different walk today. Uh, overdose sign, severely slowed and stopped breathing, little or no response to stimulant, uncontrolled vomiting, clammy skin, and convulsions. I think that's like the ending stages of you just going into an overdose mode, you know. And that's why it's very important to have this Narcan. Uh, if you run across somebody that's having these symptoms, that you, you, you can save their life at that particular time. Uh, treatment, treatment options for opiate addiction. Opiate addiction is a com complex problem that requires comp comprehensive treatment. This section outlines various treatment options available to help those struggling with opiate addiction including medication-assisted treatment, behavioral therapy, and support, support groups. 
um, I was having a conversation with one of my coworkers yesterday about this. Uh, I don't believe in in uh, medicating a disease. Like I don't want to change this heroin addict or this ad heroin addiction for a methadone ad addiction. To me, they both go hand in hand. Like it's something far deeper that maybe we can help with uh, therapy uh, groups. And like a lot of times, man, we just need somebody to really care about us and, and, and be there for us. Like that at the end of the day, we're all looking for that because we're 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 natural beings where we socialize with each other and we just know to be there for one another. I don't think we need to lean on on man-made medication to solve a problem. But that that is one of the options that they push. Um, behavioral therapy, individual groups, and family behavioral therapy programs aim to help patients reflect, adapt, and cope with cravings and the change experienced during recovery. Uh, medication assistance treatment, targeting the effect of opioids in the brain, using medication in an effective way to combat opioid addiction, methadone, uh, I don't know the other one, noxious, I don't know how to say that, are common medications to treat addiction. Uh, support groups, that's what I'm about. Like me, you know, uh, kind of alluded to that. 12-step programs such as Narcotics Anonymous pro provide a supportive community for individuals in recovery with focus on spiritual growth and the acceptance of addiction as a, tr a treatable disease. Role of healthcare providers in preventing opioid uh, misuse. Healthcare providers play a crucial role in preventing opioid uh, misuse by prom promoting safe and responsible prescribed practices. Monitoring patient health and implementing care plans to minimize the risk of addiction. This section discusses the responsibilities of healthcare providers in proper screening, patient monitoring, uh, education for uh, patient and families. Uh, if I'm in my criminality and I'm trying to get high, uh, that, does, that doesn't fly. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm trying to get high like I think somebody alluded earlier that uh, they were prescribed medication in prison uh, to fight their addiction. Next thing you know, they're, they're crushing it up, smoking it, inhaling it, uh, selling it on the yard. That's a, a form of a, a addiction within itself is our criminality. And I think they go hand in hand with uh, substance abuse. So if I'm in my criminality, uh, I'm not looking for a recovery at that present time. You know, and that's just the realities that we face today, uh, not only in our society, but in our prison system. Community-based initiative to combat opioid uh, epidemic. I can't even see this, but it said public awareness campaigns, community task force, support for families, uh, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, it's not sliding anymore. But yeah, that's that's uh, kind of my overview. I, I know I come across a little bias when it comes to uh, substance abuse and uh, criminality, uh, being a byproduct of that whole system and um, looking at the system from a, a, a as a, a corrupt system that I think it all plays in, in coincide together. Like it's no, it's, it's no mistake that all these, uh, this fentanyl is being placed in our, our communities, you know, and it's a new form of like the crack epidemic of the eighties. And it's going to be uh, criminalizing our addiction, locking our people up and uh, we need to save their lives and their freedom. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for uh, providing that context and uh, helping us understand a lot of reasons why uh, folks aren't out there trying to access these resources, right? Because uh, it's time to destigmatize, de right? Destigmatize uh, substance use disorder. And that is the reality, because if you think about it, right, I like how you said, you know, you have your own biases, right? Well, how many of us in here, right, can say that we have biases, 
how, how, how can we keep it real like that? You know, because we do all have biases. Now, whether we talk about them, whether we say them, now that's another story. But the thing is, it doesn't help our folks out there that are struggling uh, from substance use disorder to receive these uh, resources that we have, to know about fentanyl strips, to know about how to use Narcan, to even want to show up to events like this. That's why we set it up the way we set it up, because you know what? We want our folks to come out here. We want them to feel welcome, you know, because they do deserve to be here. They belong to be here. And the thing about it is we use labels a lot, right? Uh, and that does a lot of harm to our people out here. You know, if you think about it, how many of us have family members that suffer from substance use disorder? Whether you want to talk about it or not, there is a reality, right? How many of us have folks that have been incarcerated, whether we want to talk about it or not. Now that's another story, but we'll see them showing up and asking for resources later, right? So let's start destigmatizing some of this stuff, right? Uh, that That is the reality of it. So that way our folks can protect themselves. They can get the resources that they need and they won't feel ashamed about ac accessing these resources. A lot of people out there, you know, they don't even realize that there is treatment facilities out there because for those of you that never used, right? Uh, when you do use, there is a form of psychosis that happens. Now, I don't think a lot of us may understand that unless you've actually experienced addiction, but you do things that you wouldn't normally do. And that pre brings you to a state of mind where you're, it's the all or nothing. Uh, and that is the reality. So when it comes time to like somebody telling you, well, you should do this or you should do that or go get treatment here or go reach out to this place or oh, this person did it. Why can't you do it? I mean, instead of being like more like, OK, well, whenever you are ready, here's some resources for you. Here's some uh, some resources where you could test your stuff if you choose to still continue to get high. Or if you're going to get high, at least be safe. At least get high with someone around you. So then that way, you guys both have an Narcan on you. If something happens, you're going to know what to do, right? Because that's the reality. The not knowing what to do is what leads to these fatalities that we're seeing here, right? Not knowing, panicking. Uh, and that is the reality, you know? I mean, and a lot of the times I heard when you were uh, talking, Michael, I heard, uh, what can we do, right? What can we do as community members, right? Uh, as being from a part of different organizations, right? Uh, di different agencies, collaboration. But be inclusive. Be inclusive with intentions as well. Because a lot of the times, we got to build that trust. There's been a lot of harm in our communities, right? Amongst each other even amongst accessing resources. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, um, I, I find it difficult sometimes, even going to the DMV. Uh, it's, I mean, that, that's the reality of it. Man. I feel like I'm not even wanted there. It's like, and, and just think about all the social resources that we do offer out here in our community, right? How can we be more welcoming, right? How can we be able to identify like, what is a mental illness, right? What don't we talk about, right? So that we, we could address those things, right? Because those biases are there. They are definitely there. Um, I just thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, so now uh, we do have uh, someone that has been directly affected by uh, the fentanyl epidemic, the opiate epidemic. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not able to join us today uh, just based off of some complications. Um, they're really struggling, but... Uh, they came into it. They, they, they actually got uh, contacted Michael and and uh, kind of explained the, the challenges that their family is facing, you know, because they just had a, a loved one pass away from fentanyl. And uh, he wasn't even out that long. Right. He didn't know about like. Fentanyl strips, Narcan or the families weren't even uh, prepared or uh, educated on this. That's why it's so important for us to educate our people. Right. And I think when I say educate our people, right, it starts with our family. It starts with our family, and then we can start educating others as well. Because if we're not educating our family right at home, 
then how are we going to educate our people? Or how are we going to educate the people, but not our family, until it directly impacts us, right? So as she was talking about her loss, uh, she lost a brother, and the mother lost a son. They were taking it really hard um, about what happened to them and their families. And what stood out to me was like, uh, she was explaining like, I want something done, right? I want someone to hold account be held accountable, right? Um, because uh, I know he wouldn't do this, right? I know he wouldn't use knowing that there was fentanyl involved, right? And I was listening to her and I was like, I was thinking, yes, I mean, first of all, I emphasize uh, there's empathy for you and your family and I'm sorry for your loss, right? The thing that's so important is that's why we're holding this opiate forum right here, right? To talk about those struggles, right? Uh, because substance use dis uh, uh, disorder is a mental illness, okay? It is a mental illness. Now, whether we're acknowledging it within our communities, now that's another story because, I mean, destigmatizing, right? Um, so as I was listening to her and I was like, man, I was thinking like, how many others out there have been affected by just not even knowing about the resources that are available? Um, because maybe there's no conversations at the homes because maybe they're not accessing community resources out here in our communities, right? Because they don't feel wanted. They don't feel wanted or it's too shameful to ask for resources when you do have a loved one out there that is struggling with substance use disorder. So those are the realities, right? Um, that their family was being affected by. And uh, I was talking to with them and Michael was talking to them and we were like, you know, that's why it's so important for us to get this information out there, right? That's why it's so important for, for us to have fentanyl strips, to have Narcan, so then we, that way people can access that stuff. And that's why it's so important for us to have something that, you know, we know people out here in the community may need food, drinks, some hygiene kits, you know, things like that. Uh, because that is the reality out here, right? Uh, their crises may look completely different from what our crises are. And that's important for us to understand that, right? So then that way we are more welcoming when we are offering these services. So I just thought I'd share that about um, this family member uh, recently losing a loved one because they weren't uh, able to make it today. But the whole point to this is, is like, let's destigmatize, right? Substance use disorder. And let's start talking about it more. And like I mentioned, it starts with our families and then we can start working with, with, with others as well because if we can't even have those conversations with our own families, you know, obviously some, there's something wrong there. There's absolutely something wrong there. Um, so we're gonna go into our next panelist. So our next panelist will be from Riverside Overdose Data Action, which will be Jessica. Jessica, are you out there in Zoomland? Jessica, are you out there in Zoomland? I believe Jessica is joining us in 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. Uh, well, we got 15 minutes. So, I think this will be a good uh, uh, time right here. Is there any questions, comments out here from all of you that joined us today? Yes. A lot of people 
Um, but I believe we have a question from Ifyani in the chat. And the question is, what are some of your suggestions to prevent individuals from steering clear of these traps of drug use and incarceration? Okay, we'll, we'll get to Zoom land right now. We have a couple of folks out here that were asking questions. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you let us know who you are, sir? Okay, so what I wanted to, what I was asking was like, uh, what sort of additional efforts are being uh, are, are being put out there countywide to sort of destigmatize, um, you know, opioid addiction, substance use disorder treatment? Because, uh, like the brother was saying earlier, a lot of people, number one, aren't aware. A lot of family members don't know what is out there. And a lot of it kind of goes around the shaming and the blaming that that goes along with um, with addiction and addiction issues. And I just was kind of wondering what further or other uh, destigmatization efforts are kind of being put out there, if any. Okay, uh, just to answer that one, I think that this is definitely a start right here. Now, I'm not sure about any of your guys' agencies. I'm not sure who's in the room right here. But if you guys have also been working on destigmatizing efforts as well, maybe you guys could share a little bit about uh, what John Hustler was asking. Anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Is this good enough? Yeah. All right, cool. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Orlando Naya. I'm with Reach Out. My colleagues are in the back. Uh, we happen to be a nonprofit, and a lot of what we do is substance use prevention. Uh, the question about destigmatization, it's a really tough one because it has to do with attitudes. It has to do with tone. It has to do with verbiage. It has to do with the way that we address the issue in itself. If we address the issue by implementing a form where we put the blame on the individual without taking into account environment, policies, as well as agencies that are in play, that stigmatization, no matter how much we do, it's still going to continue and it's still going to perpetuate itself. A lot of the times, um, and this is something that we talk about with youth too, it's interesting when we talk about substance use prevention and the stigma, because if you happen to be wealthy, if you happen to be well-dressed, if you happen to you know, have a very nice car, very nice house, you know, that at this point we're talking about classism, right? And we happen to be at the very top here, you know, of what is the social class, but you have a substance use, uh, you know, uh, problem, disorder. Society will not demonize you nor criminalize you. You know, they're saying, they're saying and they're looking at someone who can function with society because at that point, what we're putting before most than anything would be the fact that said person can create and produce something good with society, right? So the question comes to be, how can we destigmatize uh, substances? Well, we need to decriminalize certain aspects and certain attitudes that we have. A lot of our unsheltered and homeless folks, they struggle with substance uses. There's various reasons why. A lot of it within you know, psycholo psychology studies, they found out that a lot of the reasons is through trauma. The more trauma someone experiences at a young age, the more likely they are to experiment and dive deeper into an escapism of substances for various reasons. So a part of it is to decriminalize, destigmatize, as well as kind of rebuild the institutions which we are built on, but also having these conversations first firsthand, but also being aware that 
certain attitudes may not change within our generation, but the folks who will always lead the change are going to be the younger ones. Uh, a lot of the times when we talk to the youth, a lot of them, their attitudes are very different from older folks. Older folks would say, if you know someone who's doing something, stay away from them. A lot of the younger generations are saying, you know what, if I know someone that's doing something, I want to be around them to make sure that if anything happens to them, I have the right materials and resources to give them so that we don't have another person, another young person who we lost. Going back to, the, to their statement, you know, if someone is doing any type of opioid, um, we'll do it with somebody, you know, to check that there's fentanyl. We're not saying go and do these substances, but what we are saying is to save a life, someone must still be alive. So putting the priority on someone. Also kind of understanding the history as how we ended up with these substances within our communities. Um, you can dive deep into the literature and it will show you uh, there's different agencies, government agencies that are involved in it as well. Uh, my parents aren't documented. They're from Mexico. And a lot of the times when I talk about uh, substance use to a lot of general public folks, they're like, oh, well, Mexicans are bringing, you know, substances. Well, let's take a look back. That's xenophobia at that point. That in itself is a prejudice against people who are immigrants. My parents and everybody that I know are undocumented. A lot of them do not use any substances. On the contrary, they stay within a place in society where they don't bring a lot of attention to themselves. So what I'm saying is, how can we destigmatize a conversation that involves not just our unshelter people, our immigrant population, you know, but the most afflicted, you know, our LGBTQI, our queer brothers and sisters also have a lot of trauma they go through. So these little things add up and they lead to an escapism. So in other words, how can we change the environment so that these folks can have, you know, the resources to have? A lot of it does involve just having a very frank and open conversation about the reasons why people go into it. Uh, but the, the destigmatization looks very different from community to community, but it, a lot of it is intersecting within each other. Uh, that's what I can offer from my expertise and from my research and what I've done at my, my work site. So hopefully that helps. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, wow, that was a lot of a lot of great stuff we heard right there. Attitudes, that's what stuck out to me, attitudes, right? <laughs> we all need to change our attitudes, right? <laughs> we all need to work on something, right? Uh, there was another question in the chat right here because I want to get to Zoom land too, so that way we don't uh, have them feeling left out. Uh, one of the questions was from Abiyani, what are some of your suggestions to prevent individuals from steering clear of these traps of drug use and incarceration. Wow. I mean, um, the first thing I think of, right? Think about it. When I think about it, I think, okay, some folks, right? Think about social support. How important is social support? Very important. Family is important. Okay. Uh, friends are important. Colleagues are important. Mentors are important. Professors are important. Leadership uh, is important. So the thing about it, when you think about that, right? If a person doesn't have none of that, what do you think happens? They're limited. They're limited on the information that they're able to get. Because the more exposure we have, right? The more information we're able to get from each other, the more we're able to communicate with folks. Like you said, we're social beings, right? Well, if we're not communicating with folks, right? Then how are we getting this information, right? How are we able to learn what skills we have and use those skills, right? If we're not communicating with folks, if folks are not reaching out to us, just even stop to think about like, if we might need something or if we need some information or if we're thirsty or if you're just going by someone and just completely just disregarding the person that's right there, like if they're not even there. What do you think that does to a person? The attitudes part, right? Well, where do you think that comes in? 
shit, I know I'm going to have a bad attitude, right? If I keep getting dismissed from everybody because I feel like I'm invisible. That is the reality of it, right? So maybe we need to change a lot of different things. So when we're thinking about this question, right? Uh, suggestions to prevent individuals from steering clear of these traps of drug use and incarceration, right? We need to step up. We need to step up and start uh, creating some kind of like uh, mentorships, right? Uh, some kind of teachings, right? Uh, to help our folks out there. Uh, because the reality is they end up being come, they end up coming and becoming and leading to a psychosis thought where all these different things are coming into their minds, right? And they're thinking, right, like, this is it. This is all it is. So who cares? Why would I even access any of these things, right? I'm going to go to what I know, how to self-medicate. And if I'm lucky, if anybody does pass out any fentanyl strips, or if I do feel like even uh, using it, I will. But unless we do more things like this, right, in our communities, right, and bring community people here, right, then we're being more inclusive, right? We're providing this information, right? And we want to hear what they have to say, right? That's the reality of it. We don't want to just put a nice presentation together, have it really detailed, right, and pretty much just... uh. It's just stuff that we researched. We can all do that, right? But how can you connect with one another? How can you actually grab somebody's attention when you're up here, when you're communicating? How can you do that? That's the key to think about. How can you do that? By normalizing it, by destigmatizing it, right? And by acknowledging, hey, we all struggle with this. I do have family members that struggle from this. And I have lost loved ones, right? Because when you when you stop normalizing, you stop um, addressing it or acknowledging it, how can you ever change it? How can you get more folks to start wanting to learn something, to start wanting to be involved in the community because they've been pushed out. They've been pushed out. They've been labeled. They've been looked at less than. They don't want to show up. They barely want to show up for free food. That's the reality of it. And that's because attitudes. That was a good point. Attitudes. That's the reality of it. So let's start shifting some things, right? Let's start communicating a little bit more within agencies, right? Within community-based organizations, right? That come out here and do the work and are on the ground in the communities. So then that way we can learn from each other, we can guide each other and we can teach each other all these different skills, this different knowledge, because we could connect with our folks. That is the reality of it. So um, there was one more question that I'll answer before we go on to the next presentation. Uh, the next one is addiction has so many levels. What treatment have the best outcomes? Would anybody like to answer that? Are you raising your hand back there? Oh, okay, just checking. Just checking, Andy. <laughs> Addiction has so many levels. What treatment has the best outcomes? Hmm. Yes. Oh, can you come up here so that way Zoom Land can hear you? Or Niners, that's right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daniel Como. I recently started starting over program, and I had suffered from uh, alcoholism. I had a friend who passed away from fentanyl. I had no knowledge of fentanyl or what it was. And um, for me, the first thing was recognizing. It. Hmm. You know, a lot of times we go through addiction and we don't recognize it. We get comfortable in addiction. So. Um, to answer the question, the, the best thing is wanting change, knowing that there's people out there like this group. I, I see this group getting bigger because you guys are going to become resourceful. 
We talk about the social media thing and this Mark Zuckerberg became a billionaire because he found out that what touches people, people are, are attracted to people. So it's social. So if you have to get on your, your internet or get on your Facebook and make fentanyl or make the awareness social instead of getting on there, looking at different things and make that awareness social. So pretty soon we'll have a room compact with people who are suffering through the addiction, also with people that want to be resourceful and help. So I think the thing for me that helped me was recognizing it and wanting to change. Because if somebody doesn't want to change a zillion people on this earth, and you're gonna, they're going to only reach certain people. If you've been affected by it, your family's been affected by it, then it it, it, it causes a drive. You know, you, you have this drive now to, to make a change. And it starts with this. It starts with, it starts with, with people who want to change, you know. The incentive of getting free food, and that, that brings you in. That's not the primary goal, you know. I don't know who's who's had family members that lived through it, who's going through it themselves. But a lot of times, if we're not being acceptive to people, if we're not being open to people, if we're not being able to let them come in here besides getting the free food, educate them, let them know that they are important, that they are loved, then we're wasting our time. But if this is something that you have a passion for, or this is something that has affected you or your family, all the Zoom people, then we have to start doing what these people did. Use the internet. Use the tools that they got us watching all these different shows. Let's use these tools, utilize these tools to make it awareness. To say, hey, my family went through this. It's a networking system. If I call my brother Q and say, hey, Q, I'm going through this, can we put you out there? If I say I'm going through this, and then I went through that too. Me and him together, then he's through it. So that's how these gazillionaires became gazillionaires on social media because like he said, it's social. Let's keep it social and be personal. And 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 so, go back to my question. But that helped me to reach out. You know, pretty soon this room is going to be packed with people that either want to reach out, they want information. So that's who we are. We're 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 resourceful. So to get back to that is just it helped me because I was able to reach. I had an outlet. Not a negative outlet, just like the uh, suicide prevention line. We need to have a fentanyl prevention line. We need to find out how can we have a, a network to where, you know, we get the four lines or we get the proxies of a nonprofit and we have those inter intervention lines where people can call us and say, hey, I don't know what to do. Hey, I'm, you know, making awareness and then start with the youth, guys. There's people that, my daughter's 15 years old in high school and she's telling me, dad, everybody's in class is high. It's high. <clears throat> This is, the, this is the next teachers, lawyers, doc, this generation is the next one. If everybody's high, we're doomed. I'm 41 years old. I can't give a, I can't go give a company 30 more years of my life just to get a, just to get a pension. I can't. I, I, so with, these, with the youth and with even those who are out on the streets, we have to be more sociable. We have to be more open. We have to be more uh, uh, tangible. Sometimes people don't want to hear something. Pull up. If that's what you're here for, because I believe in somebody, I ain't in the spiritual media. This is a perfect place to have it because people are going to be drawn to a spiritual place. You ain't got to talk about God or anything like that, but they're going to be drawn. So you get them in. You get them in with the food. You get them in with the support system, the love. If you can change one person, that person will change the next person. You've done your job. So I love my women off. You're good. But uh, starting over in, and like I said, just look around, you guys, because this room is going to be filled with people that want to help. People that are fed up with the abuse, the substance, the substance system, because it's a mind, it's a mind control. Sometimes you don't have control. I did six years in prison, and when I got out, all I wanted to go do was have a beer, real talk. So I was sober the whole time in pain. It was everything in me. I mean, everything. But when I got out, it was it was the life was so overwhelming that I went back to that. So we have to make it not overwhelming for people that want to, that want to change their lives. We have to make it open for them to change their lives. Be open, be resourceful. Remember who your higher power is. And I think in about a month time, this room is going to be packed with people that want to help. So when you're on social media, speak about fentanyl. Instead of getting on there talking about you went to something famous restaurant, talk about the situation at hand. If we don't start with us, what is it in? You guys have a good day.
Thank you. Well, I heard a lot of good things. Uh, uh, I'd like to highlight what you said. You said wanting change. And you know what? That plays a big factor. That plays a huge factor. And what we would like to convey is we would like to provide these resources and services whenever those are ready to change. So that way they know uh, where to access them. That's the whole thing. Whenever folks are ready for that next step, because we all, it takes it, we all learn differently, right? And it all takes a, a, a different approach within all our lives in order for us to make a change in our lives. So the thing is, is whatever it takes, we at least need to be knowledgeable where we could get these resources, where we could get into treatment, where these detox centers are, and what detox centers are working and which uh, treatment facilities are working and are not. That is a huge factor uh, because treatment facilities could be really scary. They could be really challenging and they could be really demanding and it could be really uh, terrible experience. Now, the thing is, there is a lot of good ones as well that really you can learn from. They give you that therapy because a lot of folks get in treatment, you know, they have multiple different things going on in their lives. And uh, they need to uh, work on uh, social skills. They need to work on mental health. They need to uh, acknowledge what mental health is, to be aware, of, as well as substance use disorder, um, just so that way they're fully aware of everything uh, when they go into these treatments. So they're learning, educating. Uh, and then that that way they could, they could uh, um, be knowledgeable for for themselves and 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 uh, pass this information on to the other folks that will be coming behind them because there will be some other folks. Short question. Short question before we go on to the next presenter. So much question and um, to share something. So um, I'm a breathwork facilitator. You can go online. There's things um, that you can look up like circular breath, trauma release breathwork. And a lot of times it is your nervous system. It is the trauma that people have been through that rather than looking for a drug to disconnect yourself from yourself, because there is work within families, friends, colleagues, but you have to find yourself first. You have to be able to hear that voice in your head. So there's certain breath work that you do that raises your nervous system to almost like that fight or flight moment where it's where you wanna take the drug. But at the same time as that's happening, the breath is helping working on your frontal lobe, which is your thinking part of your brain to kind of calm that down. So your subconscious, your, um, I feel like it's the heart and soul part of you. You can hear it. And sometimes people um, will use the breath work along with recovery. Um, the breath work sometimes given at certain, uh, like the um, Alcohol Anonymous, like they'll have groups that will get together and do this type of breath work. Um, if anyone is interested in more information about that, um, contact Fidel and then maybe you can let me know or however I can help serve. But um, it's, an al it's an alternative to having to use anything outside yourself. And there's also certain breath work, you know, you, they say like get high on your own supply. You breathe enough oxygen in, you feel lifted, you feel great. You feel like you shed the weight that's been like holding you back and down. So I just wanted to share that information and let people know that there's other other things. Um, if you don't feel comfortable going to any type of um, resource center or anything like that, YouTube, look it up online. You can find videos where people help guide you through the breath work, do it in the privacy of your own home, experience it for a little bit. And you know if it piques your interest and you find it to be an alternative, to what you're doing now, then please, it'll help you and better our community. So thank you. Cool, thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of great information right there. We really appreciate that. 
Um, so that just to keep track of time, we'll be going on to our next presenter, which is Riverside Overdose Data Action. Uh, thank you for coming, Jessica. Hi, hopefully you all can, can hear. Um, question, is there a screen if I share? Yes, no? You're good. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we are gonna share our screen. I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, schedules were a little tight today, but I, I do want everyone to know that the county here in public health and Riverside Overdose Data to Action is is a resource for, for you all. Um, so are you able to share it? Um, <laughs> so I did wanna share just a few data slides. We're not gonna jump all the way into it. You know, it's just gonna be a couple things so you can all see kind of the shift over time. Um, and I'm sorry, one second. I think we'll get it up right now. <laughs> Let me take a step back anyways, sorry. Okay, so we don't have access to share, but we can email this out and hopefully you all get the email or, or anything like that. Um, my name is Jessica Cuevas. I'm a program director here and I in public health and I oversee our Riverside Overdose Data to Action program. And really our program focused on, on first increasing our access to data and, and knowing who's overdosing, why are they overdosing, and how do we come in and actually help? Um, so we really have increased our capacity for surveillance, and then we're, we're using that surveillance to really guide our prevention efforts. Um, so the next couple of slides are gonna show you just the shift in uh, fentanyl. Um, as you can see, I, I'm not gonna go super into, into this chart, but I, I think it's pretty clear to just look at the colors. You know, um, the blue is fentanyl. And before 2016, we didn't really have much. There is a little bit, but not that much. Um, and you can just see the increase over time. But I do want to note that on, not that the fourth slide, that our efforts are making a difference. So in those uh, under 30, there has been a decrease in overdose deaths. So we are shifting. Um, I know a lot of efforts have been towards the youth. So we are seeing that and we're really happy about that, right? That That's good. Um, but there still needs to be a lot more work that's done. Um, so I we just wanna highlight more resources for everyone. Um, some of them are already here, like starting over, <laughs> a huge resource, as well as Inland Empire Harm Reduction. Uh, but one resource I do want everyone to know that is there and available is the Never Use Alone Hotline. And this may have been mentioned already, but it is um, <clears throat> available in both English and Spanish. And, and this hotline is, you know, if, if someone's planning on using and they're alone, no one else is around, there's no Narcan around, there's nothing that can help this person if they do overdose, uh, call this number and someone will stay on the line with you. Uh, they'll check in every so often and if they don't get a response back from the person that called, then they will call uh, emergency services to come and help. Um, so that's a huge resource and it's something that, that really helps. Um, and then also more resources, we can share these as well, uh, but. Uh, there's a few QR codes here. If you go to our Rota website, so the orange QR code, we do have a lot more resources, things that can be printed, numbers you can call for treatment services. Our clinics are all listed on there. I say our clinics, but our behavioral health clinics uh, in Riverside County. So we have everything there in one spot. So please uh, scan the QR code, hopefully it works, and hopefully you're able to access all the resources. Um, like I said, we're only kind of, I only touched on a little bit of data, but we do have an overdose data dashboard that's av available for everyone. So if you wanna take a deep dive and see what's been happening in the region or in the county, this is only Riverside County, uh, scan the green QR code and you can, take a deep dive into all the data that we have available. Um, and, and we have quite a bit. So we've even broken it up by uh, not just regions, but also healthy places index. So looking at uh, just the health conditions in certain regions. Uh, so that's that's all on there. Uh, those are all resources for you all. 
Um, if you all have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, again, we have an email. It's rhoda at ruhealth.org. It's on the website. So if you need to get a hold of us, it's there. We also have a uh, Narcan available if anyone wants it free of charge. We're not charging anyone for anything, um, as well as fentanyl test strips. So please feel free to reach out. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. I'll be on for a little bit longer. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Appreciate that. So as you can see, uh, this is site right here. A lot of resources right here, a lot of information. We also have this information on some flyers in the back. Uh, so whenever you guys, whenever you guys, after the presentation, uh, the forum, uh, when you go out, we do have some flyers right there. So you get some flyers, have some resources. It also has some um, treatment facilities as well, some detox centers and for some information as well. So now that puts us to uh, our next uh, panelist, which will be IE harm reduction. Ali, I'd like to welcome Ali and Audrey. Thank you, Fidel. Um, could we have uh, availability to share our slides? Um, are you able to share screen? Got it. I think I am. All right. Got Thank it. You. All right. Thanks. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Audrey. I'm the volunteer and direct services coordinator at Inland Empire Harm Reduction. I'm also outreach worker. Uh, okay, so a little bit of background on our organization. So we are a harm reduction based uh, organization. Um, our mission is to improve the health and well-being of people affected by drug use in the IE. Um, we offer a really wide variety of services, but um, kind of our main focus is overdose prevention education. So that includes naloxone distribution as well as um, overdose reversal trainings. Uh, we also provide syringe access in Riverside, the city of Riverside, um, and healthcare and community resource referrals across different counties. Okay, so a little bit about harm reduction. So it seems like that's a really, everyone already has a really great baseline understanding, but I also wanna reiterate that there are other forms of harm reduction um, aside from substance use. So things like seatbelts, uh, hand sanitizer and hard hats, those are all um, items and things that we use to reduce our everyday harm. So driving in a car, can be very dangerous. So seatbelts definitely uh, limit those risks and also prevent death in car accidents. So harm reduction as a concept are the things that we do to reduce the harm of all of the risks we take. Thank you. So substance related harm reduction can include things like testing your substances, um, we see this uh, with our fentanyl test strips that were provided by Rhoda. <laughs> Thank you, shout out. Uh, so you can test substances like meth, molly, um, benzos, anything like that. Uh, you could test for the presence of fentanyl. Uh, substance related harm reduction also looks like supervised consumption sites. We talked a little bit about that earlier uh, with like supervised injection and things like that, but we can also think of supervised consumption sites as things like bars and house parties and other social gathering where people are going to be aware and um, responsive if something goes wrong while you are enjoying substances. Um, sterile equipment is also a tool for harm reduction. That's one of the main things we do here is making sure that people using um, both uh, IV use and non-IV use are using with sterile equipment. Okay, so um, 
a little bit more on what harm reduction is. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but it's a set of evidence-based practical strategies that are aimed at reducing the negative consequences that can be associated with drug use. Um, drug use does not have to be inherently uh, dangerous, but definitely it can be. Harm reduction is also a movement for social justice that's built on a belief and a respect for people who use drugs. That is what drives our entire movement, um, is making sure that people who are using are the reducers of their own harm and empowering folks to share their knowledge and, um, yeah, it meets people where they're at and it provides a non-judgmental safe space for people who use drugs. Okay, and we're ready for the next slide. Um, so as a guiding philosophy, as what guides our work, um, harm reduction principles can be applied to so many different areas of our life. Um, it can be applied to not only drug and substance use, but also to maintaining healthy relationships with loved ones, with peers, to providing services at your own jobs and things like that. Um, and it just, harm reduction stops people from being injured and it stops people from dying from things that are preventable if we had the right knowledge and tools. All right, I'm gonna come in now um, uh, to uh, take the presentation from Audrey, just to share a couple of fentanyl facts. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Ale. I am project director here at um, Inland Empire Harm Reduction. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about fentanyl. So um, fentanyl can be used alone or cut into other substances to increase its potency. It's been found in many other substances like meth, MDA, MDMA, um, ecstasy, cocaine. Um, and although it's often described as 50 times stronger than heroin, fentanyl is not Narcan resistant, meaning that you can still use Narcan uh, to reverse an overdose that involves fentanyl. Um, because despite that, you know, it's still an opioid and fentanyl and its analogs are opioids and um, it's not resistant to naloxone. And one of the big questions that we get and that we work to um, educate folks on is the big question, can you overdose just by touching or being near fentanyl? And I'll leave that for the audience to think about. All right. So on this topic, um, you cannot overdose by being near or even by touching fentanyl. Um, the, the correct answer, of course, is no. However, if you answered yes, don't be discouraged. These beliefs might be attributed to the 2016 U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration information about fentanyl absorption through the skin, which has con really contributed to a lot of the misinformation that we see. In fact, uh, researchers say that the misinformation is so widespread that in 2018, the American College of Medical Toxicology and American Academy of Clinical Toxicology had to issue a joint report asserting that the risk of fentanyl exposure via accidental transdermal exposure is very low, and it would take about 200 minutes of breathing fentanyl at the highest airborne concentration to yield a therapeutic dose, but not a potentially fatal one. Also, a paper published in the Journal of Health and Justice, um, researchers found that it is critical to correct these false beliefs about fentanyl and fentanyl overdose for both the benefit of occupational and public health, as this type of misinformation, one, leads first responders to take unnecessary precautions when they're responding to, um, to overdoses where uh, fentanyl is suspected, and this really wastes time in effective overdose response. And it also does a lot to perpetuate community-wide stigma against people who use drugs by inaccurately portraying them as toxic and dangerous to be around. And so just talking to you a little bit more about um, who we are in Linda Per Harm Reduction and what we do, we provide all the services on the slide and we also collect and safely dispose of syringes. We also provide community overdose prevention trainings to members of the community through our partnership with Rhoda 
Um, and we offer organizations and institutions overdose prevention trainings um, and other trainings. For example, a bulk of our work deals with the stigmatizing drug use and the stigmatizing drug messaging. And so we offer these trainings to institutions. Um, um, and although we're not able to fulfill or provide large institutions with um, big amounts of Narcan or other supplies, we do offer technical assistance to help um, organizations get standing orders for naloxone or other uh, technical assistance. But individuals from the community can always access our services completely free of charge. All our services are always confidential and our information is on the screen. If anybody wishes to contact us, uh, get in touch with us, please uh, use these uh, contact information to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Audrey. Now, um, does anyone have any questions? Huh? Okay. The question you had earlier. Okay. So did that answer some of your, did that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, John. Um, so how can we, as a community, start normalizing harm reduction methods to assist with our society's social problems that we see in the United States? We heard a start, right? We heard a start. That's the start. Now, what else can we do? as agencies, community-based organizations, collaboration, how would that look? Or how would you envision it, is what I should be saying. Thoughts? Open. Um, 
Thank you. So we heard open vessels, open-minded hotlines. Um, did you come up? Yeah. Thank you. This is to the the counties, the facilities, the. Um, the places where people are um, seeking to uh, reduce their substance use. Um, I would say to be less draconian in their like drug testing or whatever the rules are that when people do use or just for whatever complications happen in, in treatment, um, to not shut the door, um, to not, um, I know that it's very, cut and dry and there's not room for compassion, there's not gray area, there's not understanding. Um, and I think that that, that mentality change or, or the attitude change to one of actual support and understanding and healing would be beneficial and better to everyone. Cool, thank you. What about Zoom land? You got any questions on Zoom land? No. Does anybody else have any? Uh, could you can you come up here, please? That's why everybody don't want to have a question. Huh? They want to come up. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to share some of the research that I've uh, that I've encountered when it comes to not only. Uh, uh, opioids, but uh, just uh, prevention in general. And it also hits home because uh, as a father, I was able to deal with it um, and apply what the research says. So the research says that it has to start in the family by understanding the, the, the parent's mental, um, mental health condition and understanding that if you have a condition, chances are, and I'm not a doctor, so don't quote, but uh, the research says that there's a large percentage of probability that your kids are gonna have a similar ailment. So personally, I dealt with it at the personal level and also with my offspring, where I started uh, self-medicating uh, before I got diagnosed and he, my life went in a spiral, in a downward spiral. And, but I thank God because now I'm here and, and I was able to save my, uh, one of my children uh, when he had a, a dark moment. And he said, hey, dad, I need some fentanyl. Uh, do you have a hookup? But since I already been through the, the, through hell and back, I was able to not only address the situation. I was able to understand how he felt. And I was able to talk to him at his level, like everybody was saying here, that uh, to, to understand what the problem is. 
So personally, and the research shows that it starts at the family unit. And then from the family unit, obviously you've all uh, heard the, the adage that says it takes a village to raise a child. And it, it takes, it's gonna take the school to understand what the situation is, the, what the substance abuse is linked to. It's gonna take uh, the psychologist at the school and it's gonna take the whole village. And I'm telling you from experience, all my three children are, are uh, doing well, but he took me changing my paradigm and understanding what my uh, mental uh, ailment was and to stop self-medicating. And I'm now sober, I'm here and I'm happy and I'm, and I'm thankful to Fidel and starting over for uh, putting uh, this uh, program together. So I, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, yeah, we heard a lot of great things. What I would like to get back to is uh, this last question that we actually, this is gonna be the final question uh, that we actually talked, well, I asked the question, what treatments have the best outcomes, right? I'm not too sure about the research part. So maybe if some of you folks know that research, uh, but from personal experiences uh, and just based off of like interacting with different people, I would think that that question is kind of like, it depends. It depends. I don't know if there is an answer to that question because what works for one person might not work for another person. That is the reality of it, right? So the thing is, uh, I'm not even sure if they have that research, to be honest. I never even looked into it. No? Okay, so they might not have that research. So that's definitely something to look into. But just from personal experiences, and I'm sure for those folks that do have experiences as well, it's not one uh, shoe fits all, you know? Something's going to work different for every individual because we're all unique in a different way. And we all learn in a different way. Um, so before we head this out, uh, I'll take your question real quick. Comment? Okay. It's the last comment, and then we're going to be closing up. So the question was brought up as to how do we as a nation, as a society, as a community, what can we do to ensure that certain punishments, certain attitudes, uh, legalizations in regards to the views politically and socially, we view the usage of substances, right? And I think it's really important to always look back in history and understand that substances have always been used within every society, uh, understanding how they went about it, right? But I also would like to bring in the fact that it was around 2010 when Congress passed the Fair Sentencing Act. Like, for those that know, it reduced the sentencing disparity between offenses for crack and powdered cocaine, which was 100 grams to 1 gram to now 18 to 1. Why is this important to know? Well, when we talk about the 1980s and 1990s, this was the supposed crack epidemic, right? We saw the criminalization, not just of poverty, but of black and brown bodies, meaning that we need to be aware of how legislation works and who does it affect more than others. In this case, so we're going to be talking about destigmatization. We're going to be talking about, you know, what can we do so folks don't end up trapped within the uh, the dependencies of any substance, or for that matter, how can we make it so that there is? I saw someone saying, "Make more." The shirt says, "More schools, less prisons." So that's the same thing. Education is a big thing. We need to understand where we come from. We need to understand what affected us, and we need to understand what is continuing to affect the society that we live in today. A lot of the times, the fights that we're having, a lot of the conversations that we're having nowadays, it happened a few years ago. It happened a decade ago. It happened two decades ago, three decades ago. So this in itself is a reoccurring issue. This in itself is nothing new. But if we take a critical step, we'll realize that we're just part of another step where we're just busy, you know, trying to figure out what can we do. Well, let's get to the root cause. A lot of that is just education. So in regards to schooling, schooling will advance a lot of our folks out there. You know, schooling will also allow for folks to have more of an open-minded uh, type of view, as well as understanding our history, understanding legislation. You know, a lot of things, a lot of folks say, I don't want to get into politics. Uh, a lot of things are politicized, meaning that a lot of things are made to be uh, 
yes, no, black or white, take a side, right? When in reality, they're complex. When in reality, they have different implications for different communities. So in other words, it's understanding what we're getting in. And through education, uh, through well-resourced uh, love, uh, that's in something else. Uh, this is something that, um, and the independence of Mexico is on the 16th. And they usually, the president says an announcement. And within that, he said, uh, may racism end, may queer phobia end, may love prolong. And he said, love, long live love. And a lot to make that love possible, we need to have well-educated communities. We need to have communities that have resources that they need. Food insecurity is a big thing, you know, water, fresh water. We know we have our folks in Michigan who themselves for a big time were on the news and were, you know, a lot of people were donating. But I think now, present day, a lot of folks are forgetting that Flint, Michigan still has really bad poor water. And, you know, what is this, 2023? And we stopped talking about it. So just like everything that we bring up, it dies down. So it really belongs to us as a community to keep that fire lit, to keep these issues, issues alive and keep it at the forefront. We are a voice, but more importantly, we need to make a change. That usually tends to be politically. So how can we make that happen? That's just my two cents on that. Thank you. Thank you. You heard a lot of good stuff right there. The main thing that stuck out to me the most was history repeats itself. So whenever we're having the conversation or whenever we're putting the presentation together, think about history. So then that way we could bring it back into the conversation so it doesn't get erased. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I would like to thank all those on Zoom land. I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, I'd like to thank the UU Church uh, for making it possible for us to be here at this space. And uh, please take any information on the way out that we have at the tables. And if you would like to connect connect with us, please put your uh, your email and your contact information on our sign-in sheet. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Zoomland. All of us. All of us. Get involved.